I now have the opportunity to uh, introduce uh, Jack Gallant, who's a professor of psychology and vision science at UC Berkeley, and super excited to hear what he has to say. Thank you. Also, so I didn't uh, have an opportunity to attend uh, the first day, but I know many of the speakers, and so I think I have a except for the airport cockpit bit, which I don't really understand what happened there. Uh, I pretty much understand how these conferences work. Um, now, uh, one of the things that makes the human brain unique and different from all other animals is that we have a vastly expanded neocortex. And that neocortex facilitates the complicated kinds of thought that humans can engage in uh, that we're very specialized at. For example, a long-range planning, moral judgments, language, things like that. And a lot of the process, uh, a lot of the problem in my lab is to try to understand how the brain uh, supports these kinds of uh, complex thought. Now, using modern neuroimaging, we can actually, hmm, using modern neuroimaging, we can actually uh, investigate the brain non-invasively and follow these patterns of brain activity as people engage in complicated tasks. So in this particular case, uh, people are simply watching a video and we're tracking uh, brain activity using MRI. And this is essentially just unprocessed, unnormalized data. We haven't modeled it at all. It's just to give you a sense that uh, any time you're sitting around listening to a story or watching a movie or listening to this talk, there are these complicated patterns of brain activity as information is flowing back and forth with different parts of your brain active at different times. And each individual piece of that uh, puzzle, each of the individual piece of that pattern collectively produces the emergent property of thought. And uh, if you think about it, this is really uh, matching thought to patterns of brain activity is really just a giant uh, machine learning regression problem, right? There's some complicated thought, there's a pattern of brain activity, we want to find the systematic relationships between those two. And we can do that using modern technology uh, and a lot of computer power. So uh, here I'm showing a brain map from one individual subject who spent about two or three hours in an MRI machine listening to stories. In fact, these were normal narrative stories from the Moth Radio, our public radio international. And uh, the colors across the surface of the brain here reflect, reflect different semantic domains, uh, different pieces of meaning uh, that are represented at different locations in the brain. So for example, the red spots on this map show the uh, locations in the brain that become active when you hear about social information and stories. Things about your mother, your father, your brother and sister, murder, uh, weddings, all kinds of things that involve social information. The bright green spots indicate uh, parts of the brain that become active when you uh, hear a story about visual information. For, exa for example, a description of a sculpture or uh, the paint on uh, in a building or wallpaper or anything that's visual. Um, the dark green domains are domains that become active when you hear about numbers. Uh, and, and those domains also become active when you hear about time or dates or quantities of uh, measure like ounces or money. So all these kinds of information are mapped across the surface of the brain. Uh, in this particular experiment, we were mapping about 2,000 semantic domains, but we can uh, uh, map usually about up to 10,000 or so in one experiment. Now, that map is really complicated, and it's impossible to even think about it. So we can go in and just look at one kind of information and try to see how that's mapped across the brain. So this is a map for the concept of dog. So if you're listening to a story and uh, dogs are mentioned or things associated with dogs, then these locations in the brain become active. And you can see that when you hear about dogs, a lot, there's a lot of locations in the brain that become active. In fact, the general principle of semantic information coding in the brain is that each location in the brain that represents this amodal semantic information uh, represents a constellation of related semantic concepts. And each semantic concept, like the concept of dog, is represented at multiple locations in the brain. And presumably, that's because these different aspects of dog-related information that are represented are, uh, are closely tied to our sensory experience. So for example, one part of the brain might reflect how a dog sounds, another part might reflect how a dog looks. Uh, an area of the prefrontal cortex might represent information about the time you were a little kid and a dog bit you and you don't like dogs, right? All that information has to be mapped in these complicated constellations of meaning. We can actually go through and interrogate individual locations in the brain. Uh, this is a little brain viewer you can play with if you want to uh, have some fun. It won't run on your cell phone, but it'll run your laptop just fine. And you can click around different locations in the brain, and you can find the semantic concepts that our experiment uh, predicts 
that part of the brain would be activated too because that part of the brain is representing that type of information. And here I'm clicking through the social, uh, several social areas. There's a lot of social information uh, uh, represented in the human brain, as you might expect, because we're very social animals. Uh, and you can click around and sort of see that information. It's just to give you a sense of what's in there. You can also use these complicated uh, regression models to do decoding. And this is because there's a fundamental symmetry between an encoding model and a decoding model by way of Bayes' theorem. So if we can build a really good encoding model of the brain, we can use that to decode information. And on the left here, uh, we're decoding structural information uh, from the brain. We're decoding information from a very low-level visual area called primary visual cortex, which is the area that uh, the retina EJ was just talking about feeds into first. Uh, is the first stage of visual processing. There are actually about 50 individual visual areas in your brain, and at the highest stages of visual processing, uh, the information is represented in this semantic form, which, where we have the meaning of objects, the meaning of three-dimensional objects, and the decoder that decodes from those brain areas is shown at the right. We can build brain decoders for all of the 500 or so brain areas simultaneously and decode the information from each of those areas that is represented explicitly in each of those areas. OK, that's all great. The question is, can you use this for anything? I mean, this is a science project. It's really great for science. It allows me to publish science papers, which is, frankly, what I get paid for. But we would really like to take this technology and use it for something useful in society. And to do that, we have to move uh, into a very uh, rapid method of doing individual mapping. The experiments we do in my lab take between two and eight hours spread over weeks of data collection in order to build these models. Can we do this much, much more quickly? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to map individual brains. This is four individual brains. You can see that these brains are similar but not exactly alike. In fact, if you take all of the variants in uh, brain maps, about a third of the variance is common between individuals, and about two-thirds reflects individual differences, which are di differences in individual experience and individual development. Uh, and in most experiments done in neuroimaging, the individual subjects are never examined or mapped at all. Instead, the data is aggregated together. So here you can see uh, eight maps on the outside of the, uh, the circle, the concentric circle here, of brains. Uh, this is just mapping two kinds of information, place words uh, minus a ba or one kind of information, place words minus a baseline of no words. And you can see that uh, the average map, which is in the middle, shows some place word related activity. But you can see that that average map doesn't match any of the individual maps. And if we want to use uh, these kinds of functional neuroimaging methods for, say, uh, diagnosis or prognosis or monitoring, we're going to have to come up with a very fast method of building individual maps for individual patients. To take one example, uh, if we think about autism spectrum disorder, uh, autistic individuals uh, seem to represent many aspects of the world, especially the social world, very differently from neurotypicals. It would be really useful if we could map those kinds of representations in the brains of subjects. But we have to do this very, very fast. Basically, we have to take, have a method of taking our experiment, which normally would take, say, between three and seven hours, and reduce it down to something that takes 20 minutes. So essentially, most neuroimaging experiments, if we think about uh, the sort of cloud, the Gaussian distribution of individuals, uh, most neuroimaging experiments would simply map the mean, which would be the, given by the blue spot here. And we want to map each individual subject, which would be given all by the red in, you know, uh, points in this distribution. And we can do this with machine learning. Um, we couldn't do this until recently because we just didn't have the computer power. But now, if you throw machine learning at this problem, you can solve it actually quite nicely. So this is one machine learning solution to this problem. It's called a multi-view autoencoder. Uh, it essentially integrates many, many individual brains and many different kinds of uh, stimulus and task spaces. So for example, visual stimuli, audio stimuli, and so on. It integrates all this information together. It reduces it down into a low-dimensional representation. And now I can take a new brain or a new stimulus type and map it through this autoencoder and get a prediction uh, with very little data. So this allows me to map across brains or map across tasks or map across stimuli very, very efficiently. And you might think, well, can that actually ever work? And it turns out to work remarkably well. So on the top here is a semantic map from a narrative comprehension experiment. This is, again, from people listening to about three hours of stories, uh, these moth stories in the MRI machine. And in the bottom is a semantic map from a multi-view autoencoder that was actually obtained uh, by someone watching 10 minutes of a movie. 
but we extracted from the brain activity we had the information about the semantic map. Uh, and you can see that the map, uh, the mapping between the top and the bottom is very, very good. These correlate quite highly, even though instead of collecting three hours of data, we've simply collected 10 minutes of data. So this is a very, very efficient method. Now, um, so this is kind of one of my schemes. I would like to take MRI, which is a, a method that I love, and move it into the clinic. Because right now, fMRI is just a scientific curiosity. It's hardly used in the clinic at all. The only case where it's used is to do mapping, uh, pre-surgical mapping for epilepsy surgery. And other than that, it's not used at all. So the idea is by coming up with these very fast methods of scanning and then uh, using machine learning to basically infer the missing data, we will be able to use this for a wide variety of prognosis, diagnosis, and monitoring. So we can monitor the prognosis of degenerative brain diseases like Alzheimer's. We can look at autism spectrum disorder. We could look at psychiatric illnesses that affect cortical representation of information. But another part of my evil scientist scheme is to move this technology into something that is portable. Because MRI machine, as I'm sure Mary Lou mentioned, is an incredibly inefficient a not uneconomical technology, right? Berkeley has a giant grant from the NIH to build the next generation of MRI machine, and that is going to end up being a $30 million project. So uh, it would be difficult to imagine building one of those, you know, in every house. That's never going to happen. So we want to come up with portable methods of measuring brain activity. All the portable me methods that have come up in the past are, uh, frankly, pretty sad. They don't recover much information at all. Uh, Mary Lou, I'm sure, talked about her awesome work using, uh, uh, trying to develop new methods for doing functional near infra infrared spectroscopy. Uh, I have my own uh, strange scheme uh, to try to do, use microwave imaging for this. So this is a microwave brain imaging device. It's essentially used as radar technology, but instead of sending the radar up into the sky and getting reflection back from the plane, it sends radar into your head and tries to uh, image the brain. And this is a, sort of a state-of-the-art uh, microwave imaging. On the right is the brain reconstruction. Um, it's kind of sad. Uh, we have a, a method to do this that we think works better. So on the left here is our uh, anatomical reconstruction of a dead sheep's brain from this microwave technology. And on the right is our anatomical reconstruction from MRI. And you can see that this method seems to be working pretty well. So in the future, uh, I think these advances in non-invasive brain imaging will lead to three really important things. Improved medical devices for diagnosis. Uh, things that can be done for diagnosing uh, and monitoring mental health. And of course, eventually, all of this will be moved into civilian society, where we'll have essentially ubiquitous brain-computer uh, interfaces that will be continuously reading brain activity out from us. And that introduces a whole bunch of interesting ethical uh, issues that I won't talk about in the interest of time. But I'm happy to discuss them at our leisure. Thank you. <laughs>